All right, we're rolling. Sure, you can record me. Yep, oh, it is recording. Okay, cool. <laughs> we're gonna do this forever. It's, it's, is it, you know, is it recording? One one of the, one of these days, eventually, it'll be like we know what we're doing. That day is not today. Should we leave this in in the podcast? Hundred. This should be the intro. Hundred percent. One hundred percent. This should be the intro. <laughs> Welcome to Paperweights, the podcast where two self-proclaimed gym rats and shooting enthusiasts delve into the world of literature with a sprinkle of humor. Although their biceps could crush a walnut, don't let that intimidate you. They also have a nerdy side. Mike and Brandon have a voracious appetite for reading, particularly in the fantasy genre, and they want to share their passion with you. So grab your protein shake and your favorite novel and join us for a humorous and insightful journey into the world of books with paperweights. All right, welcome back to another episode of Paperweights. I'm Brandon. And I am the incredibly overexposed Mike. I got the sun coming right in at me, man. It makes me look like I'm a ghost here. (laughs) <laughs> and we are the paperweights so um yeah dealing with the overexposure there um it, in, in a life. in a photography and and light <laughs> sense not the other I, I'm, I'm not naked yeah not, he, he, he has clothes <laughs> on so at least a shirt yeah but it just <laughs> says depth all i see is depth ah gotcha <laughs> yeah Funny. <laughs> Giggity. Giggity. So this 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 week we start our new book, um, In Conquest Born. And not that you can see it, but yeah. Before we get into details of it, how did you like the first 129 pages? You know, I, I really once it got going, because the first little bit was like, wait, what wait, hang on, what? Huh? And then once it, once I kind of pieced it together, I was like, "Oh, okay, now I now I'm rolling with it." It was it was interesting. It was very very interesting. And you, you've you've read Dune, of course. Yes, you you said. Have you, have you read any other sci-fi, space opera type stuff? Mm-mm. So I don't even know what defines space opera, but. Uh, let let's see what Google says here. I did think Space that the, that uh, was an interesting um, you know, explanation on the front of the book. The space opera with brains. The only thing I can figure is like a, like an opera. Like there's going to be a big setup for some gigantic climactic ending. That's the only thing I can think about. Because whenever I think of an opera, yeah. So Google. Uh, thanks for the Oxford Dictionary, says a novel, movie, or television program set in outer space, typically of a simplistic and melodramatic nature. I can tell you now, this this is not simplistic. I was about to say the same thing. <laughs> this is not simplistic at all. Yeah, so like, it, it takes, I, I don't know if you read the uh, introduction by Friedman for the this version yeah i read the intro oh cool cool and the in the once upon a time so we didn't get to in the introduction she actually says chapter 11 is a chapter she's really proud of and Mm -hmm. was a chapter that she wrote that she knew she was going to be able to be published at that point the night before her thesis was due yes (laughs) and so we but we ended at chapter eight so we haven't gotten to it yet it'll be in the next reading so i'm excited to read about that But I like how, and most most sci-fi books typically throw you into the fire Mm -hmm. with not providing a whole lot of backstory or explanation or definitions of words they use Mm -hmm. and things like that, cultures. And so you really, with books especially, so like, with with tv shows and movies Mm -hmm. you can visually see what's going on and your brain starts to process right you know you you get the setting the location that they're in you see things in the background the foreground you see 
people that are in the scene and interacting with. So it, it's, it's almost easier to get in to a sci-fi movie or TV show as opposed to a book mm -hmm. because you have to read more words in, in the book. Um, you have to spend more time with the book to get the same setup of everything and understand who's in the room, what the plot or not plot, but what the setting is. Mm -hmm. And so at first it could be very foreign. Well, especially with, with, with everything you just said, that's actually something I thought she did well at the beginning was that that opening chapter, we get a lot of, we get a lot of backstory from, from that character. We do. That, we do. So I actually thought she did. She did the setup pretty well. Mm -hmm. She she does. Mm -hmm. um, so this is not the first book I've read by her. Right. However, this one does start off really easy, and I will say it moves. The overall plot moves kind of slow. Yeah, and kind of not sure where exactly it it is going. And because you can definitely chapter, feel the you can definitely feel the tension building as it goes though. Oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so like, you know, not not having read up on anything, no reviews of this mm -hmm. book, and I haven't, I didn't talk to my friend about what he likes about the book, etc. He just said, "Hey, read this one instead." Mm -hmm. I thought, you know, reading that first chapter and getting to the end of it, I was like, okay. So now we're going to, you know, we're going to spend time with these people growing up. That's what I thought too. <laughs> <laughs> I was wrong. <laughs> and, and yeah, so, so was I. And so I, do, I don't know how much time passes. And, and that's another thing. She doesn't re truly mention mm -hmm. right away anyway, how much time passes. Right. Um, we do get at some points um, with, the children that are born later on in, in the later chapters, it says how old they are. Um, so you kind of feel and you get the sense of, okay, at that point, this war has been going on for a while as well. Um, so let's, let's just dive, let's dive in now. Uh, kind of talked about the overall, our feel of, of the first eight chapters, but um, I love from from the first few paragraphs in this book, I love how we immediately see how different Veneer is mm -hmm. from the rest of his people. Yeah. Like he starts saying in, in you know, it's like, okay, I enjoyed this. I I wear these clothes where mm -hmm. most of the people wear these types of clothes. Um and I didn't go back and read it after I had a more of an understanding of the differences between the Asia and the um Braxani. The Braxana, yeah. Mm -hmm. So and, and also don't know which version of the word to use to describe. I know they well they use they, they use like three different ways. Yeah, there's Crazy. like Braxin, Braxana, uh -huh. uh and, and then Braxani. And, uh, the Braxani, yeah. Or, Bra or Braxi, rather. Yeah, the Braxi, the Braxin, yeah. the Braxana. Yeah. So that's kind of confusing there. Um but I would have loved to go back and reread here to see if it was actually veneer is different than humans because of his class, or was it because he was Braxy? So I, I think because I, I kind of went back and like skimmed over it a little bit so I could make some so I could go back and redo my notes a little bit. I just I think because he is because he's Braxy. And there he's he's part of the purebred part. He like holds himself to a different standard. And he refuses to be anything like because they consider themselves to be the master race. Right. Like there's a lot of rate, like you've like there's the a racial, lot of racial the there. racial tension in this book is sky high. And uh they consider themselves to be like the master race. And so like they're doing whatever he's doing whatever he can to set himself as far apart from the commoners as he possibly can. Yeah, and that, that's interesting too. And I didn't actually get to that in the intro, but um lots of sci-fi books actually deal with eugenics. 
and mm -hmm. using science to uh, create, you know, favorable traits mm -hmm. and forced evolution. And they, they used inbreeding. They used the, the Braxi used inbreeding <laughs> while the Asians, they, I mean, they used a type of, I kind, like, kind of liken it to puppy breeding. So they, they breed in certain characteristics See, and that's how and they came up with telepathy. I thought that it was, gen I thought they were doing basically like, I, I equate it to like gene sequencing. Like they were going in and like, physically messing with people's dna yeah so they yeah they they had a uh the ability to look inside at mm -hmm. conception and that was another thing interesting and we're getting way ahead of ourselves but the idea of conception so the asians don't congratulate like mm -hmm. conceiving a child means jack shit to them. yeah they don't care <laughs> it's like okay cool that is what happens right it's like con congrats you had sex yeah great <laughs> <laughs> once the child is born then yeah. we congratulate you on the birth of a healthy child because mm -hmm. we also learned that the, ch the children most of them don't survive so, are you, so you're talking about the the braxons no the asians oh because they because that was so i've with in that first chapter we learned that a lot of the braxon kids don't survive either I may be getting it confused. I, th I think I think you were getting them swapped up a little bit. Yeah. So, okay. Because the Braxton I, I kids, I they so. were they were saying whenever they're going through all this, and so let, let's let's back let's backpedal a little bit. I thought it was very interesting how Veneer refused to drop this facade, like this mask of superiority, until he was all the way through his bedchamber into his bedchambers with the door shut. And then he told the mistress of the house, we are alone. And that's the first time that he kind of relaxed a little bit. Mm -hmm. And then he learns from her. This is another thing I thought was interesting. She was his mistress. She was the mistress of the house. And like she was in charge of the day-to-day -day operation of the house, not his wife. Also not the mother of his child. Like for them, they just have sex with whoever. Right. And it was said, it said that, there's so many kids that are stillborn that the fathers don't even get excited about it until they learn, until they find out if the kids survived. Right. Yeah. I'm, and, I'm glad you pointed that out. I did. I did to make that up. So I thought that was pretty interesting that, you know, Veneer had, you know, he has a son learns it. And like, he was almost shocked. He was like healthy. Cause it said, if he would have been born stillborn, they just would have mentioned it to him like later on in a meeting. Oh, Hey, by the way, uh, the child was born, but it didn't survive. Right. But he was shocked to learn that he had a pure, a purebred son. Yeah. And I, I wrote here. Um, so early on, something struck out at me. The, with the Braxons, they're, they, like, there's not only do they think they're the superior race over the Asians. Mm hmm. But within their own society, they they basically dehumanize their servants as well. Yes. <laughs> so, like, if you're not purebred, if you're not of the upper class, then mm -hmm. you're just kind of you're hey, nothing. You're part. You're you're part of this. You're nothing special. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah. And they and to them, women are nothing. Like this whole the whole Brixani thing. Like women, they can do nothing. They can own nothing. They can't command a man to do anything. Yeah, that's going to come in big later. Yeah, almost yeah. an exact phrase is going to come in big later. So, <laughs> yeah. So, I in reading through, I was I was making notes because of all these uh, unfamiliar terms. So I was mm -hmm. like, and I'll just kind of go down here. I, I wrote chimera, and I yep. was I wrote a title question yeah, mark. I, I, and I, I think, think that means is, lord. Yeah, because it as seems I to be like the next... reading it, I was like thinking like senator, like almost almost like the way we would use senator or like mm -hmm. in in Star Wars they would refer to senator. Yeah, like Senator Palpatine, Senator Almodal, right. like type type situation. Yeah, it, it almost seemed like with especially with them and them that they, you know, they have their Braxani adulthood like 
okay, now they're fully adults. And then you can be extended into this next level. And that's where that chimera, whatever, however that word is, chimera. Yeah, there's chimera. Chimera and chimera. Yeah. There's, there's two, there's one with an I at the end and one with an A at the end. Yeah. And they Maybe seem that's be... gender based. I don't know. I don't think it's gender based. I think they use them almost interchangeably because later on we learned that they have 48 different speech modes. Yeah, that's. Which is nuts. <laughs> like, it's just crazy. But. Yeah, it almost seems like you like you become an adult, and then if you want an a, a extra, like an extra status level, you have to be nominated to this next thing, and that's where that chimera comes into play. Yeah, we 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 do late, later. Um, somebody is supplanted in that uh, triune mm -hmm. of chimera. Um, so I did. That. I wrote myar. I didn't write any. I didn't go back and write anything down. So oh, I, for, I, for for Nyar. Is it is it Nyar or Myar? It's a, it's with an N. So here's something else I thought was interesting because that so whenever whenever Veneer's son is born, he tells him it's un, and this just tells you how much this this race loves battle and how much they think it's important. Mm -hmm. He tell he tells his son. How unfortunate that you're born in peacetime. And then he uses his son's and he says, I will not name you until we until we're un, in battle. He uses his kid's birth as an excuse to go to war with another planet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I wrote that was that, that was at the the end of it. Yeah, he, he sends a note to the emperor at the end of chapter one. Or at the end of section one, rather, talking about, and the emperor's like, "Wait, what?" And he's like, "Yes, for the naming of his son, he's they took over this planet." <laughs> yes, he, he breaks the, <laughs> and it's it's not even just like it was something like the nine hundred and something peace treaty with Asia. Yeah, you know, like the conse like nine hundred and sixty eighth <laughs> consecutive peace treaties. Like, <laughs> no, I needed to name my kids. So I'm gonna break this treaty and go to go take over a planet. Yeah, I, that was wild. <laughs> I can't find it in the book, so um, I'll look it up later. Uh, I do. I, one one thing I was excited about here is, sorry if you're listening, I clicked my pen right into the microphone. Uh, when he gets back into his 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 apartment, uh, he's given this vial that he drinks, and immediately yeah. he, he's refreshed. And I was like, "Yep, they've got fucking healing potions." <laughs> 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 they have got healing potions that work really fast really fast well they're well they're incredibly rich yeah and then um so something else i don't want to skip over um they so i i, I still have some things to talk about oh. veneer if you're if you're moving nope. away from veneer nope go ahead then so you know i wrote all right so sin t is the, is the mistress of the house yes that's her name mm-hmm Pasiva is Veneer's wife. K apostrophe S I V A. That's that's his wife. Um, they are tribal people. Yes. And what I almost gathered that the Braxons, like it, if they use the term Braxon, almost mm -hmm. refers to a lower class of the 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 people of of Braxy. Yeah. Braxana. And then the Braxana refers to the upper class. I, yeah. That's the kind of thing I, as I was reading it and, and they're using these terms, I was trying to differentiate why they're using different versions and, of it. And it's, and it's very nuanced. It is very, like, very, very it, nuanced. The way they use it, it's sometimes they it almost seems like they use it interchangeably, but then sometimes it's very clear. They're referring to a certain level. And sometime later on in the book, I picked up on something where two characters, and, and I didn't make a note of it, but two characters were talking and one used a specific um, term that we already knew knew was uh, a, derog a, a derogative term or mm -hmm. a lower class term. And they used it when speaking to somebody of a higher uh of a higher rank so yeah i think at, at times they use it as an insult yeah 
like you are mm-hmm. such and such right and, and so the person's like what <laughs> like you know if you, you're a plebeian or you're a neanderthal mm-hmm. it's like okay you have somebody was here heard us talking it's like hey we're humans you're americans right. and then i'm like hey you neanderthal and they'd be like right what? what's neanderthal <laughs> mean and why is it capitalized right <laughs> uh so that in, in that the the braxi are are tribal people as well mm-hmm. they're more brutal uh simplistic barbarian like um people with very little uh influence of science yeah they they uh like no science no they're just they're all about brawn very little brains all brawn even though we find out they can be very cunning and very calculated very cunning and calculating in use of subterfuge yes and another part of the world is golden rings are like they're like data disks yeah um so if you're reading that if you're reading through that and trying to figure out what all these terms are golden rings they're almost like data disks cds something like that yep that's um, what i imagine them. i imagine them as like little small like just little d small cds that are just solid Mm-hmm. That's what I imagined about us. Yeah. And so that that's that first section with the Braxi, our introduction to the Braxi society. And the next the next section we we start to learn about the Asians. I'm guessing that's how you say that. I didn't know if it, I, I didn't know if it was like Azine. I didn't know if that Z was supposed to be really hard. Yeah. I don't know. Let's let's see what the internet says, possibly. In conquest born. Or as or as in, I don't know. I just feel like that Z should have should have a, a little bit more harshness to it. We get yeah. a, it's incredibly brief the exposure we get to them. Like we yeah, get a lot, we get a lot of we get a lot of information very quickly on them, and there's not in there's like it's in a very very condensed. <laughs> Yeah, you could have told me that I was reading this stuff on the internet with my mouth just open like a mouth breather. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> when this gets posted on, on YouTube later on, it's just like, uh, <laughs> Neanderthal. Uh, <laughs> me, computer. <laughs> <read. Drool. laughs> These poor people listening to the podcast. <laughs> Maybe we should bring up a map here and talk about a map, you know, like <laughs> there's no maps in here. There's, there's yeah. no map. <laughs> there's no map. Um, so one cool thing about the the Azine people, however you say it, is because of because of their commitment to science, they started living on this otherwise inhospitable inhospitable planet and basically genetically modified themselves to be able to live there. Right, because they mentioned originally when they moved there, they couldn't breathe the air, but right. they they used genetics modification to be mm-hmm. able to breathe that air, and even eat the food. Like the 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 every everything on this planet was designed to kill them. Mm-hmm. And that that that's that is a common theme with a lot of C.S. Friedman books mm-hmm. that I've seen is like a colonization of planets that are. Um, originally in inhospitable gotcha to to the human race mm-hmm. um so i picked up on that and yeah i also so i thought this section was it was brief as well i didn't write many notes about that section uh, but we do learn that uh darmal darmal lu tu kun and suan mm-hmm are married and they have a child of their own who is uh born in peacetime and not allowed to be recognized in public so this is where they are this is where they are the exact opposite of the braxton because the second they figured out they had conceived a child they took it for gen- they they go in for this genetic testing and they start doing all this deep dive genetic testing. They find out that the child that they are pregnant with 
is not somehow not an is not pure asian yeah so i don't know if this is like immaculate conception or what but the, <laughs> because because the child is not pure asian not only do they tell them to abort the child of which they refuse right and then they did cuz like so it's i think it's important to note that darmal is he is actually a first he is a first descendant or he's a direct descendant of the first settlers of the planet. He holds the highest security clearance on the planet, and he is what they call a transcultural scholar. So he's one of the few people on the planet that has studied the the Braxana language and cultural culture enough to be able to eloquently tell the Asian people about it, but then also be able to communicate back with people that are Braxi. Mm-hmm. And they don't really give us a lot of information about his wife, just that she was um, part of the security team. That's really all they told us about her. She had a security clearance, which security is a big deal for them. So the reason why the child would not be recognized is because it was not pure ASEAN. So they were like, we'll never hold a security clearance. It'll never do this. Y'all can never again hold a security clearance. Y'all can never. The child cannot step foot on the like. They go like they give the, them all these reasons why they should abort the child, and they told them to pound sand. We're keeping the kid. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I didn't realize. Um, so I don't remember that they took their clearance away. Um. I thought they did. I may have I may have misread that, but I could have sworn they took their clearances away. Was that the end of chapter one? Yeah, I I I don't see anything. I see I see where it says she will never have security clearance. No, that, that may have been what it was. So the child will not be can never be a citizen of the empire. Mm-hmm. The child can never have the most basic security clearance. Right. Um, but they made it a huge deal of why they shouldn't keep the kid. Right. She may not receive the benefits of Asia genetic science. Mm-hmm. Her appearance may not be tampered with. She may never in any way become involved with the war effort. Yeah. Which is an interesting thing, you know, if you're at war with people, you're like, no, you can't just because you're not pure, pure blood of our, our, our race. And Which so, I mean, if it's, it's so weird, because like they're, they're at war, this, this, she's being born from parents that are highly respected. No, she can't, she can have nothing to do with it. Nothing Maybe they hit. Maybe they have some superstition about, you know, if you're not 100% of our blood, you're inherently going to be a traitor. <laughs> I don't know. It's interesting choice of words you use there. Um, yeah. So I, I think her parents still have uh, their security clearance. They just couldn't do anything with their clearances to help the kid. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, so it says the girl is born in peacetime, but war, as always, comes again in the 986th comprehensive peace treaty between Braxi and Asia shatters in a splash of human blood between the stars. Mm-hmm. That's a pretty cool uh, description there. Yeah. Her, I'll tell you what, her um, her ability to describe things is really, really well done. It's not as long-winded as uh, Robert Jordan's. It is not. It is not but as long-winded you, as Robert Jordan's, but it is it is brief and concise. She does use the the description of clothing at some points to kind of remind you of which society or mm-hmm. which race you're you're looking at. Um, and the cover art actually helps here. It's, yeah, here we have Zatar, and there we have I think. That's either Ansha or or Torja. Um, so I don't think that's either one because of the red headband. 
The red sure. head, the the red headband is used by the psychics. Right. But but the, the telepaths, right? Right. Well is that is that what that girl's name ends up being? Ansha? So Ansha Ansha is the name of Darmal and uh Suwan's daughter. Okay. So yeah, so I yeah. think that's who I think that ends up being Ansha. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that's on mm -hmm. show now. Whether or not they're actually ever in the same room, we'll find out. I know, right? <laughs> right now, they are stars away from... Actually, no, they have been in the same room. <laughs> Later. <laughs> We're getting there. <laughs> so, Chapter 2 is an interesting... Uh, we'll move on to Chapter 2. Chapter 2 is an interesting because it's just a letter yeah. from a girl named Nian who... For some reason, when I was first re when I read through this as I was mm -hmm. reading it at the beginning, I thought, "Oh, this has got to be the daughter that was born." And now we're fast forwarding later, and yeah. they're going to be married, and they're going to solve this war. I was wrong. Yep. <laughs> but Nian is writing a letter to her sister, explaining that she why she's not there. <laughs> yeah, I'm not there because this. I I met this man. And it's great, and you know, he he tasted me for the first time, and that's not just like an oral thing. It's it's their their description of taste. This is just yeah. like tasting of of the flesh, tasting yeah. of the act of sexual intercourse. Yeah, or, there, or, there, there's a lot of sex in this book in the first eight yeah, chapters, and we, we learn that the the Brax, Braxton are very romantic and very um sexual undertones mm -hmm. and they have a lot of aphrodisiacs yes so i originally wrote in the note as like is this darmal and swan's daughter i came back and wrote no nope. exclamation point <laughs> um i did write if so is this romeo and juliet <laughs> because i could see that star cross that lovers <laughs> Well, it's um, funny as you say that you've used that in earlier when you were talking about the use of you know an underclass citizen talking to an upper class but using the wrong thing. I was like, I bite my thumb at you, sir. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but I, I didn't pick out anything specific in this letter um, to talk about other than I, I think it's just setting up that of uh, but Zatar, um, love life and how he's growing like that's like his coming of age to being an, an adult. But the yeah. interactions between him and Nian actually reminded me of um, the two main characters in 1984. Okay, it's been a minute running since around, I've read that running one. out, yeah, experience, experiencing the flesh, right. Um, trying to do everything with Big Brother watching, right? Because like he's he's under scrutiny because of where he's from, mm -hmm. like his 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 parents. Yep. So um, so there's a couple of things that happened in this letter that uh, when I first read through it, I didn't think anything of. But then when I was going back through and reading my notes, I was like, oh, okay. Now I see why this was important later. So whenever Nayar, like, cause, cause, so, um, uh, is that Zatar? Yeah. He, he tells her, they call me Zatar the Magnificent and Slight because he had, because he was born in peacetime and he hadn't done anything yet. It's really what mm -hmm. I got. And he basically falls in love with this girl who is a tr who I can't figure out what this trader mark is. I don't know if it's a brand, if it's a if it's a thing they have to wear. But he he they're not even allowed this. The traders are this lower, this lowest class of citizen. They're not even allowed to look what they consider royalty in the eye. And that was what. Attract that was what the initial attraction was, was she was basically breaking the law by staring him in the face. 
And so they have this big exchange. He starts falling for her. He leaves, tells her what his plan is. And she's captured by three people. She's captured by Sechva, however you say that name, Vareel, and Veneer. Or you, uh, yeah, you, the, 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 tri, the, the triune. Yeah. So, yeah, one of them, Veneer is her, his dad. Is, is, the, is the dad. Yeah. And the, the two other names, for sure, that first name that I just butchered is going to come up again later. Yeah, but, I, 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 I would pronounce it Sechava. Sechava, that makes sense. Yeah. But the thing that I thought was interesting was um, he told her his whole plan. And that he was going to be leaving, but and she to go to go to Asia and and to and... do this thing, and she does and she doesn't spill like she she's tortured pretty badly for a while, and doesn't and never says anything. So I was like, okay, and I don't know if it was because he was the first one to show, you know, the daughter of a traitor, you know, basically the lowest class of their citizens any kind of affection or trust but she doesn't say anything Zatar comes back and rescues her and to me this is the first time we see how incredibly calculating Zatar is because he shows up he rescues her takes her with him to her to his father's house no, and gets there and the the lady of the house is like well he's in a, a conference or a meeting he's like perfect he literally kicks the door open and all these guys all, all these guys they remind me a little bit of you know like the the capulets they all walk around with swords all the time mm-hmm. i don't know if it's a status symbol or if they they're obviously well trained in them as we found out earlier good and they uh he kicks open the door and starts switching back and forth between these different speech modes that they that they keep talking about but we find out that he went to the, he went to a not to a planet and poisoned their lead transculturalist mm-hmm but he hit out. He was gone for two years, right? Poison. He infiltrates and po- this, 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 these. Uh, I don't remember which island, which where they were. But the, he infiltrates the ASEAN people, gets close enough to their head transculturalist to poison him, and then bails. After he's confirmed that he died, after he's confirmed that he's dead uses that to get nominated to because you have to be granted your inheritance and not nominated to adulthood by your father right so he kicks in the door and basically bullies his dad into granting him his inheritance once he's and then like insists on being able to use nayar as a servant which was like a giant slap in the face because she comes from like the lowest of the low of their people. Yeah. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It's, it, it, to me, like the, this whole, this whole little exchange showed me like, this is not something that he did on the, on the whim. Right. Right. Like no, he, no, he, he, he thought this out. Because this, he also, right after he got, and he like requested this certain estate, which I think is going to come in later. He was like, he requests this estate on Zaheen. It's like a, a distant moon. And like his dad offered it as like a slight, and he was excited about it. So I don't know if he was excited because it's kind of far away. And he can plan his stuff easier or what, but he was excited about it. But this was where I got 
or where I started putting it together about the whole uh the use of that Kaimar as like like you're talking about senator. He said, Who's gonna nominate me at the Citadel? And I was like, What does that even mean? Right. But then that you re- you really goes through some big exchange of words, like some big um can't even think of the word right now. Uh ceremony. There it is. Some big word ceremony. And like elevates him to the citadel. Like not like recognizes him that he should be. And then that Savicha confirms it, which apparently surprised everybody. So he achieved the rank of Chimera. Is is that where he, he supplanted his dad on, on the, the triune? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So his his dad's out, and now it's him in such of a and the third guy, whoever yeah. it is. You really or something? But that was Ural. it. I just, yeah, yeah, Ural. So I thought that was interesting because again that that was incredibly that was incredibly calculated. Yep. And I thought it was interesting to get. All of that from a letter. Like that was just a different, that was a completely different take on how to give that, like to show somebody's rise to a rank from a letter that apparently she's writing all of this out while he's like going at it with her. (laughs) because <laughs> like, yeah. like, the end, like the end of the letter she's like it's hard to concentrate with his hands all over me <laughs> yeah it's, it's 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 a great way for exposition like the the use of the letter mm-hmm. writing to explain more than two years worth of events on that side mm-hmm. um and so not only that but we we also understand like so, this is interesting because this rise of power, like this is the Tar's rise of power, right? So, if all of these events are crucial to his character, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm pretty sure we're going to find out. The event that he like succeeds in to become the Chimera, that event is the crucial turning point for Ansha on the mm-hmm. Asia side. Yep. And so, you know, at first I was like, well, why didn't we, why didn't we learn about the, the girl growing up on mm-hmm. Asia? Like, what is that? And it's like, well, it, it's apparently not super interesting. Cause we were, we were already told that right. he will not have any clearance at all. Mm-hmm. And it's like, okay. So she just stayed at home. <laughs> yeah. That's kind of the way I got that's like she, she's, she's gonna be homeschooled. Inside. She can't go play with the other kids, like nothing. And so yeah, I I read all that, but I didn't know like I stored it as I read the story. I go, oh mm-hmm. okay. And and I took took away the end point, right? Right. In, in this in this place. And a lot of times that's kind of how I read through stuff. Mm-hmm. But if I reread it. You know, and, and I admittedly only read the whole thing like once. Right. If I was reading a chapter and I didn't understand what was happening, I would reread it over. Yeah. Um, but as far as going back and rereading it, I'm like, okay, I don't know what to take notes on here because I can <laughs> I can sit there, I can sit where I write everybody's names and you know, okay, right. this is such and such, this is such and such. Um, but I love your take on that because it it also enhances my. Um, my understanding of the book going going forward. So when mm-hmm. we have these conversations, they're like, "Oh yeah, okay, I missed that. That's interesting that you found that important. Mm-hmm. I missed that." And you know, it's like no two people are going to experience a book or a movie or a TV show in the same way. Right? They're going to pick up on things um, that are either relevant to their situation. Mm-hmm. relevant to their experience um 
or mindset. Right. So um, it's kind of like one of the, one of the reasons why I wanted to have this book club <laughs> podcast, to talk to somebody about books that I'm reading. So I'm not just reading it and going, Oh, cool story. <laughs> cool story, bro. But I, and I'll tell you the only other on thing to the I, next one. The only other thing I got from this chapter, because the next chapter, I got very little out of the next chapter. But the I got a lot out of the next one. So the only other thing I got <laughs> out of the, out of this one was that most women, I could because I can't say all I know, but most women of this race, culture, tribe. They are so low of status that if any man walks up and says, I want to have sex with you, they can't tell him no. Yeah. Like that, that's how that's how and I think that is going to like how low they view women is going to come up big later. Cause I really uh, feel like I really feel like it's be something big is being set up. But that's I think her pointing out how low women's status is is important this early because like again i can feel something building yeah and so at, at this point so now now we've had you know i i don't know the proper time to ask but <clears throat> which side do you think is supposed to be the protagonist i don't know but i don't think I don't think Zatar is going to be the ultimate bad guy here. I don't think so either. I really it, don't. It's, it's, I don't think either one of these sides is is truly right. I think what we're seeing with the way some of the stuff is lining up is going to be a very unique co coalition, if you will. That's what I see coming. A very very unique coalition. Yeah, and and I, I think it's, I think it's interesting here, to see these two different races, mm -hmm. and their their upbringings, their social codes, and get to know certain characters and go, oh, okay, I, mm -hmm. I connect with this character yeah but then also see that this character is ingrained in some of these parts of that society that oh, yeah. we we deem immoral or flat out wrong mm -hmm. or barbaric or neanderthal yeah but i mean the braxons are described especially by the asia society mm -hmm as barbaric yeah so you know we're supposed to feel that way and right. then the braxons they look at the asians and be like okay they're dabbling in stuff that's not meant to be dabbled with right but also we get to view members of the asia society and go okay those are people mm -hmm. like those are legitimate people with these feelings in in kind of um conflicts in their head with within themselves and versus their society versus this opposing society that they're at war with right and you know i it, it's it's true with with our world as well it's mm -hmm. like okay no one country, no one city, whatever, has everything figured out. Right. And most of the time when they're fighting, it's you're pointing out the bad thing of the other society. They're pointing out the bad thing mm -hmm. of yours. And to each one, it's, oh, you're completely evil. Right. And through stories like this you you can kind of find okay if you actually talked to people mm -hmm. so with these viewpoints it's us understanding the inner workings of people right 
And so, like, if you could actually talk to somebody on, sitting on the other side of the table with a different belief than you mm-hmm. and connect on an emotional and and um, mental level, mm-hmm. you would understand that the majority of beliefs and thoughts that you have are very similar. Yeah. And you're you're picking these these little things to be at war with. Um and they even said it in the book is like nobody remembers why these two societies have yeah. started the war. <laughs> so it's just like, okay, well, all right, we need some peacetime. Hey, it was peacetime. Yeah, it's peacetime. I need to name do? I need to name my kid. Okay, we're gonna go back to war. Yeah, let's go back to war. I need to name my kid. Oh, what? so weird. <laughs> yeah. I, I love I I know this is going backwards, but I loved how the the emperor for the empire was like, wait, what? Are you ready? To, okay, I just want that's what I thought you said. <laughs> like even he couldn't believe it. Yeah. So moving to chapter three. One of the interesting things I noted, I had to stop clicking that pin inside the microphone. Humans, at least in, in telepaths, mm-hmm. can live to be well over 100. Is the, the director of star control is 120. Yeah. So that's interesting. So, um, and I wonder if the Braxtons live that long. Or if it's kinda, just the Asians. I, well, I kind of got that feeling that both of these races live a very long time. Like I like just from the just from the way that some of the communication went back and forth about the different characters, I kind of got the feeling that both that both of them live just a really long time. And so was it was it Veneer or or Darmal that you had said was a direct descendant of the first? That's Darmal. Okay. So we have two cases of people in the Asia society that live a long time. Yeah. Of course we don't know how long the war's been going on. Mm-hmm. But I mean nine hundred and eighty six treaties and they but they also measure time differently they have like standard years they have something called zents zents yeah i meant whatever. to look that up like i think i've they they've got they they measure they measure t- each and each one of them measures time differently so it's it's we it's kind of it's really difficult to get a grasp on the only time I got a grasp on time was in chapter was in the next chapter in chapter four. That was the only time I truly got a grasp on how long something had been going on, because they because they explicitly said a year. So okay, so I actually wrote the question there at the end of chapter four, but um, so in, in chapter three we pick up from the aftermath of Zatar uh, assassination. So yeah. I, we, we go back in time a little bit. So chapter two brings us here. Chapter three brings us a little bit further back, but in the, into the Asia society. And so we, we have a telepath and a probe right now. now there's there's a distinction between the two, but I don't have a complete distinction. But a functional telepath, an FT, mm-hmm. is somebody that can affect emotionally, can start to affect somebody emotionally through telepathy. Right. Um, they also have the ability to probe, but I think the probes can just read thoughts and and feelings. They can't project them back so i I don't think they can but i think the the difference is i think the probes can communicate back and forth with the other person psychically yeah i can see that 
but that, there's, there's no that was emotional... the biggest difference I got between the two is the probe can be like, I hear you, you hear me, you hear me, whereas the just the regular FT can just hear the other person. I picked it up the other the opposite direction. So the FT can do the stuff that the probe does, but can also manipulate somebody emotionally through this tel- telepathy. I, I will be completely honest. That part, the whole them explaining the different psychic things confused the crap out of me. And I read, okay, it, well, I read it like twice. <laughs> yeah. Well, 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 by the end of the book, maybe we'll have a better understanding. I hope so. But <clears throat> they are looking inside of Darmal's daughter's mind to figure out what happened and to bring her back out into the real world. Because mm-hmm. she completely had a traumatic experience and shut herself up mm-hmm. into her mind and is basically comatose to the world. Yeah, and we don't we don't get a feeling here as how long she's been in that state. Correct. They, they 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 mention it's been a long time, but they don't really say how long is long, you know. For some reason, when it, when I was reading that chapter, my memory, I, I, for some reason, I felt this this is this is the uh, movie reel I had going uh-huh. in my head when this is that these two people were in this other room with the daughter, while the dead bodies were in the living room like that's what i <laughs> that this so, scene is 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 what i picture i didn't picture this scene while a while after i pictured this one immediately after like the cops show up so here here's the only reason why i say like it would have been nice to get a passage of time like some sort of reference point here is because like in the next in the In the next two chapters, we get a definitive timestamp for how long it's been from the time of chapter three to that point. Mm -hmm. But we don't have anything saying how long it's been from the time she was comatose to now. Like we kind of get an idea, like because they start talking about it later, but like right, but like right now, it's just like. Is this 20 minutes? Is this 10 years? Like, because they say she's been in it, been coming with us for a long time, but it's like, how long is long? Get, throw me a bone here. Right. And I I don't believe I wrote down how long later on, but uh, we'll get to that when we get to mm-hmm. that. So, uh, I wrote here that Braxton telepaths don't exist. Yep. And that telepathy is a product of the Asian science. Yeah. So that that's cool. And they, they believe it's a, a it's a step up in evolution. So instead of forty four and two, it's forty six and two. Yeah. So they, and their uh their goal is for like telepathy to just be another language. Right. They want everybody to be telepathic. Yeah. And we find out that Darmal's death awakened his daughter's telepathy. So Mm -hmm. nobody believed that she would have telepathic powers. Right. Um, And so that finally awakened it within her because the probe goes in and is actually communicating with the Dharmal on a subconscious level or telepathic level. Yep. Does, uh, did you ever play the, the game Cyberpunk 2077. Mm-hmm. Okay, so one of the features in that game is you go and you can pull a, a chip from somebody and replay their the memory at, like visually. Okay. And so like in, in it's a big thing in the game. Um like big parts of, of quests okay. where you go through and you're trying to investigate something and so you kind of place yourself into an apartment and replaying this thing from different angles and mm-hmm. being like, okay, what's going on? I think that's 20 cyberpunk 2077, but 
the the probe going into the mind reminded me of that. And it was pretty cool. Mm. So it's just like you're replaying an event like a movie, but right. from somebody's memory. Now you're going to be tainted from it's their perspective and their right. experience. So I imagine it's going to be influenced. It's not just a their eye is a camera lens right. recording something. I imagine it's going to be um, affected by their mind as 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 you and I would. Right. You know, if we go around, we see we see some a road rage incident. We could be like, oh well, this person was definitely angry. Mm-hmm. Probably something happened earlier that day, and we probably imagine that they did something. We 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 try to play it out beforehand, like to justify it. <laughs> yeah. So I'm sure it's all tainted there, but. Uh, they they find out what happened, which we did. We one the one thing that I got was interesting of why they picked that particular probe was because that probe was also a transculturalist, much like her father was, mm-hmm. with the exact same, you know, Brexani Azia specialty, and right. so because she presents as Brexana. He uses the Brexana stuff to probe into her. And she's like, no, there are no Brexana psychics. And he's like, well, I'm not Brexana, I'm this. See, I can't so, I, I remember reading that and mm-hmm. making a mental note of that and go, oh yeah, okay. But I did not write that down. And that's <laughs> like I I think these are very important things. Yeah. Because of the nature of this book. Mm-hmm. It, it's the the two societies are at war. Yeah, th- those those, so those different that... little things are going to be. I think those little nuances are going to be big later. Like they're go- they're going to play a, a important part in almost every single chapter of it. And I'm glad to have you here as my chaperone <laughs> to, <laughs> to to hold your hand me of this. <laughs> yeah, it's so, a like I love, um, and this is the first one I'm going to talk about right here. But in between the chapters, we get. And we find out later um, who these names are. Right. Um, I went and looked, at the and looked at one of the names in in the glossary, but then I was like, okay, I'm not going to keep looking things up because mm-hmm. some of these things in the glossary it has like a whole paragraph that explains something. I'm like it's got to be explaining shit for the whole book. Right. I'm like I'm not gonna I'm not gonna spoil myself here. Um, I, I but, freely admit I have not looked up any of it. Like I, I've uh, I've read the little the little excerpts in between the chapters, but I haven't actually gone through and looked up like what they're from or any of that. Right. So <clears throat> first reading through it, and, and I I kind of got the feeling that these were like philosophers or something. That's kind of the, that's kind of the feeling I got. I kind of feel like these are, you know, different you know lecturers or you know educators, philosophers from that both societies both yeah from both societies because we're, we're kind of this doesn't tell you which one they are yeah but you can pick up clues so like harker so on page 37 harker says civilized man longs for the illusion of barbarism either his culture fulfills this need by adap- adopting its outer tra- trappings or he will be seduced by his first contact with a culture that does so like this this actually kind of reminds me i don't know if you read any jack donovan the way of men uh i think i, I did but it was a long it's been a it's been a minute okay yeah so this kind of reminds me of type of stuff that he talks about mm-hmm. and so it's just like um it's 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 weird <clears throat> and it goes back to like okay people long for conflict they they, right. they want to avoid conflict mm-hmm. but they like to think that they're ready for conflict right yeah you know, it's like i see red and bodies hit the floor <laughs> Jeez. Like, that, that's, don't get me mad bro i just see red just see red and the bodies hit the floor um right, so that, that <laughs> it's kind of that's kind of what i felt right there with with that excerpt from whoever hardcore harker is mm-hmm. um and so like 
you know, that they'll seek some, they'll, they'll seek it out, whether it's within their own culture or a c- culture that is presenting it to them. Right. So, um, kind of, kind of two things. It's like, okay, we want barbarism. We, we, and then we're going to find whatever we want wherever. Mm-hmm. So, uh, how are we doing on time right now? I have no idea. I know we've been going for about an hour. Okay, we're really enjoying this conversation. We're halfway through. <laughs> so I have a feeling I have a lot more back and forth with you on on this as well because I can't spoil anything. It's <laughs> yeah, amazing because you're, you're not just going, huh? We'll see. Huh? We'll see. <laughs> like, I don't know how to continue this conversation because <laughs> I have all of the knowledge, <laughs> right? <laughs> So uh, we we can move right along to chapter four. Um, chapter we don't want four this, was weird. We don't want this to be uh, a three hour episode, right? Right. On the first eight chapters of this book. Yeah. Chapter, chapter four was so weird. Yeah. Did you? So this is where I laughed out loud. This chapter is where I laughed out loud. Did you? Okay. Have, did you? Do you, do you did, have any I, guesses I, as to why? I, I, I'm going to guess it was at the are there any women on this te- i'm gonna call it a telecast for lack of a better word and they're like no he's like drink this image in boys <laughs> <He's> like, <laughs> it just, was. It was he said taste this director yeah. i was just like, and then it just cut out you know, like huh <laughs> that dude just sent this porn to yeah. all of these people and and so that, that actually brings me back to um my interpretation of this and i uh was it uh a relay yeah it's basically basically a psychic relay almost like they were lining satellites up but it was it was uh telepaths yeah it was just going from one person mind to another because Mm -hmm. apparently uh there's a distance that your telepathy can work i apparently but apparently you if you get enough of them together you go across the galaxy right i mean that's like Mm -hmm. satellites it's just like Shoot from one to one, to one. bouncing off of one brain to the next. <laughs> yeah. So, like, I legit laughed because he's like, you know, this uh, Farron, yeah. and uh, he's just like going on. And at first, it was like this type of this this type of sexuality is is foreign to yeah. Asia too. And so, like, so, at first, he felt uncomfortable with it. Mm-hmm. But he was like, she, she did this. Like, yeah, she's my sugar mama. Yeah, and she did this, and oh man, it was great. Yeah, and they're like, what? Yeah. And then like several several communications later, he's like, mm-hmm. hey guys, check this out. And he probably just like sends them his his, uh, his fetish. His high, he's, he's, <laughs> he sh- he shoots them his highlight reel. <laughs> and they're like. Dude, we don't want to see that. We work with you, right? <laughs> and it's well, this and this is the first time we really get a. We figure out like how we don't know exactly when he got there. Wh- how long Farron's been there, but we figure out that he's now sleeping with the mistress of Ural. One one of the triad. We that's when we also find out the veneer was ousted for Zatar. Mm-hmm. And now he's like, hey, you know, Zatar's not that bad of a guy. He, but he also says that he thinks he's his dad is. How do we say that? So, I forgot how we said his name. So, with the S, the, the S one, the so, oh, Sechava, Sechava. He's like, because he says he doesn't know who his dad is, and he thinks that it's Sechava. And we then we find out. And this was the other thing that I picked up from the previous chapter was that the probes can basically implant a mission into people's mm-hmm. brains. Mm-hmm. And so they were able to, for Darmal's daughter, they basically programmed all of her hate and rage at the Braxani race. They, they they just drilled that into her. Hey, you hate the everybody in this race, right? And and not not only that, but it, so they could program that in, 
but mm -hmm. they're influenced by i guess they call them mentors here yeah like their experiences they they have grafted experiences from their yep. mentors it's almost like it, it, it kind of reminded me a little bit of star wars where they're like like not the new star wars but like or the, the new new star wars where it's like where ray was able to fight with like the entire power of all the fallen jedi spoilers were... oh, dude that movie's been out for like how long now <laughs> spoiler <laughs> nothing but uh you know because they mentioned because they mentioned like whoever their me the psychic mentors are kind of determines how powerful that psychic is yeah yeah so like if there's like if she like if they're trained by a psychic that's 100 years old they basically get a hundred years worth of experience in that training session. Power leveling. Yeah. Right. <laughs> um, yeah. What, what, one of the, one of the earlier things in, in that chapter though, is funny is the uh, Braxani food is, is spicy. Yeah. And for a Asians um, and their wine is very strong. Yeah. So, um, Roxiana, Louisiana. Louisiana, they're Cajuns. Yeah, they're, they're, they're Cajuns. <laughs> so, yeah, the, the Braxana are, are Cajuns. Um, but then we find out the spy, farron has been there for 20 years. That's like the one timestamp we get for sure. But we also find out they purposefully, the Asians purposefully put him there to unknowingly infiltrate and start to grasp onto his Bruxani side. Yeah. And he, he thought he was just going to do this mission Yeah, and, and go, okay, I'm going to pretend to go here. Mm -hmm. But they but, wanted him to latch onto that Bruxani side. That was their whole game plan. Yeah. They didn't, like, they, it wouldn't have worked if they told him that. Either. Yeah. But on top of that, like, dude, that is patience to do something and 20 years later go, all right, boys, the plan worked. So <laughs> what? So a 20 year game plan? Did the beginning of this chapter, was that when he was sent? Was that 20 years before? Yeah, that, that whole chapter is 20 years. Because each one of those transmissions is a jump in time. Right. I know that. Yeah. Because it says kind of at the end of the chapter is like, well, you know, after 20 years. And I just thought, I was like, man, that's, that's crazy that it's, that he's been, been there for that long. And at, the, and at that point they finally flew us in on how long he's been there and what their game plan was. Cause at the end of the chapter, it says we only have to wait. So they set it all up, and then mm. they, then they have to wait. Because I'm, I'm trying, I'm trying to line all this up because this happens after the daughter is born. Okay. See, that and was the we, part that I couldn't figure out. Was we was, know? Was, sorry, we know in chapter five that uh -huh. the daughter is like fourteen, somewhere in there. Yeah, Somewhere. so it's I'm trying to trying to figure this out. So, um, yeah, he was already wherever he was. Right, on Brax Braxy, F Farian was already there. Right, but you can tell with that first with that first transmission. That it, he was still very new to it, right? And then it's just, you know, they get down to where this other one, and they start the thing. Basically, the thing I got was or the thing I enjoyed was this part in the middle where they start talking about Farron's file and how much they're 
putting him into it and the reason why they put him there and they're laughing about he's like conflicting loyalties that was the whole point we programmed him to have conflicting loyalties and to gradually go to that Bruxani side right and then he talks about being you know being friends with Zatar and hated to serve him food that was so bland Right, that we 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 find out. I'll look at it later um, mm -hmm. instead of wasting time. It, it was funny later on. He um, he was mentioning about food, yeah, and, and he's like, "Yeah, this is bland." Yeah, yeah. So you know, or he, he was eating a Asian food, right? Right, and so he 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 got accustomed to the the spicy food. <laughs> well, <laughs> once you have spice, you can't go back. <laughs> right. Did you ever see that? Uh, oh, who was it? It was a um, guy that plays Ted Lasso, and he it was an SNL skit, and it was at a courtroom, and he was playing a, a southern man, and he was like, "I sentence you to eat the spiciest bowl of jambalaya." <laughs> it just reminds me of that. <laughs> uh, so, in, ah, in this chapter, hey, I found it. Okay, that was twenty of four. You said you were distinctly so talking about um, the neatest. What chap it, What page is it? So it's on page forty-five, about halfway down. Talking about, uh, you know, you must bear with me. I'm, I've been using my telepathy to do this stuff, and all you did. After all you did to divorce the two within me, talking about trying to split the Braxani and the Azil side, and said that was twenty of four years ago. Of so your maybe that, years ago, yeah, twenty of your years ago. So I, that's where I got that twenty years. Yeah. Okay, I'll have to I'll have to review that later and, and figure it out. I didn't get the sense that it was twenty years because it's smack in the middle between when we find out that uh, Ansha's parents were killed, mm -hmm. and then when Ansha is doing all this stuff, and she's still a kid. I know. I kind of I kind of read it as that was like a flashback scene to show how long this spy has been there. That's the way I read it. Okay. Yeah. We'll continue that later, like I said. <laughs> uh, so, uh, Brixani weed out unwanted traits by killing infants. Mm -hmm. uh, and we, we find this out through this relay of information yep. from Theron uh, that aren't purebred or have undesirable traits. They just don't trust immaterial or non-material powers like telepathy. Mm -hmm. So they value the martial uh, abilities more than the uh, mental abilities. Very Spartan. Yes. But it remind, yes. reminded me the opening of 300 was like if the child was seen to be scrawny or deformed of any kind, he would have been discarded. Right. That's exact, exactly what that reminded me of. And then the last thing I had on that chapter was the question of Farron's assimilation into Braxana culture took how long? And we were <laughs> discussing that um, because I didn't get a sense of how long it was because I knew each jump was time mm -hmm. passing. Um, and when you brought up 20 years, yeah, I don't think it's 20 years. I, I, it's got to be probably, I would imagine it's like a year or two. Yeah, I don't. I don't I know because he, end... he mentions moving to a different part of town, and I think in order for him to be like, for him to have been there long enough to invite Zatar over for breakfast, I really feel like he would have had to been there longer than a year. Like you're talking about having dinner with the ranking guy, mm -hmm. so I don't. Know, I feel like he's been there longer. Possibly, maybe, maybe, uh, maybe we'll find out later. We might, we might find out later. I have a feeling we're going to go back to Farron 
Yeah, because uh, he hasn't popped up yet, um, and he hasn't died yet. And died yet. And yeah. and I'm really looking forward to getting to the next couple of chapters because chapter five was pretty cool. Yeah, chapter five was really cool, and you start to follow a, a, a certain uh, person, and I was starting to think that um, this was the start of the real plot and i yes. thought this was gonna go on for a while agreed it resolved itself it resolved itself before we went to chapter six yeah so Ch we, chapter five i really think we start to get the first glimpse of where this is going yeah we we i love the opening scene with uh lawn lawn set and we yeah. find out that the high arc um we're introduced to the high arc which is a glad gladiatorial battle sport mm -hmm. so we've got sparta here yeah these um, these guys are the spartan warriors like there's like hands down which which is very interesting because this is um so the the high arc you have to be dari yep a, a, a dari race to be a member to be into the circle and, and mm -hmm. enter into the high arc and to watch and to watch the ritual and part, to watch the ritual yeah. at the end also to partake to partake in it for sure. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, most I, I gathered. I mean, there were people that stayed in the stands and watched it from afar, but the yeah. majority of people did leave. Yeah, the the people but that weren't Dari definitely left. Yeah, and it, this is a this is an Asian um, planet. I, I'm pretty sure it's, this is a different planet. It's a different planet. It's under it's under Asian control. Correct. So but it, it seems it, like it's a very uh, loose, tentative control. Like, like the Asians say they're in control, but the Dari know who's really the boss there. Right. So they this is they they're there for the resources. Yes. Like, <clears throat> and and they hate that too. Like the Dari yeah. hate that they have to give. It, it it's it's not a. It's not a uh, very entwined and loving mm -hmm. relationship between the two. No, not at all. And so, like, it, it's interesting. They, the Asians, they don't like this barbarism. Yeah, they, they find so it repulsive. The Dari, that's their escape from mm -hmm. being colonized, essentially, by the Asians. Yeah, and I, dude, this fighting style, like this little trance thing they go in, is nuts. Yeah, like it's I, crazy. I, I kind of got lost in some of it and didn't uh -huh. want to get caught up in too many details of it, so I was like reading it. I was like, oh, okay, that's cool, and then kind of like moved on. It's like, okay, how's this fight? How's this fight? How's this fight? <laughs> so, um, between. And I didn't make a, a whole whole lot of notes here, but um, feel free to in interject anywhere here. But like in sections five, uh, or, so section one is just the introduction to the hierarchy. Mm -hmm. uh, in sections two through six here, I kind of lumped them together because I, I I I got caught up in reading this, right? And so I just like read it and it was like, okay, all right, I have to stop now to go do this <laughs> so uh this is my stopping point uh, let me let me write some notes before i forget what i was just reading um so i didn't have a whole lot and uh, i think i was writing in the car too but so with section five section we, five or chapter five chapter five section five chapter well, okay. i guess i'm the, the placement of them was weird so in my head, I was calling them sections instead of chapters, but it was it's probably it's chapter yeah. five. So we meet the star commander, this Torza, Torja, yeah, Tor Torja Air Litz. We meet Lon Lonset, who's a blood letter, and Anshalu, who is awake, is awake. But we don't we, but we don't really get a sense of her until later. I don't, I I really I dug this chapter, and the the thing that I really liked was she was like so. Ansalu tells Lonset, "Hey, there's a not only do you have a spy on the planet, but he's a Braxton and he's participated in your rituals." 
Yeah, he's pretending to be a Dari. He's pretending to be Dari. And they're like, no. And she's like, he's done your ritual. And they're like, that's he's a blood him, letter. That set him off. Yeah. He's like, if you can prove this, I will do whatever you want. And she's like, got you. Yeah, that that was that was a really cool. Uh, so the way that played out was really cool. Well, but that but that goes back to what I was talking about how the importance of the, where the Broxy view women because they Lauren Lonset does another one of the high arcs and she comes out to participate in the ritual. Right. Yeah. And the spy throws a big fit about it and walks away. And that was exactly how they knew who it was because he couldn't believe that the spy, the spy couldn't believe that a girl would come and do this ritual. And I loved it was later on. It was Torja. Um, yeah, when Torja deduced who the spy was and she used her, her telepathy to be like, mm-hmm. okay, if I was, if I was the spy and I was in this, how would I survive this? Because I don't have the ability. Okay. So I need an excuse as to why not to, um, but so well, she maybe an it injury. She, she called it a hunch. She, she would uh, follow her hunches. Oh yeah. It wasn't. So the, the daughter whose name I keep forgetting to write down. Ancha. Uh, she was the one that, yeah. Oh, there it is. She was the one that used telepathy to figure out where he was. So here, here's, here's the thing. And this is, this is where it was confusing because when this, when this first started mm-hmm. and we, so we know, was it Ansha we met first or was it Varric we met first? So we because... so we meet we meet Varric earlier. So okay. Varric, Varric is the one is was one of the ones that uh captured uh no he wasn't. No, no. So but I, I feel know. like I feel like I've read I feel like I'd read that name earlier. Okay, so but I didn't we... write it down if I did, so maybe I didn't. No. I think this is the first chapter we meet there. Yeah. So first we meet um Lawn Set and then we meet Torja mm-hmm. and then we meet um then we meet Varric and we, we yep. learn that Varric is the spy. Yep. So I mean obviously because it's it's his point of view. Mm-hmm. Um and then uh so so it was interesting to see the the eyes so torja noticed that there was a there was somebody sitting in the back watching the 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 ritual mm-hmm. at the end um but when we first meet ansha she says she has a connection to the spy which i thought was interesting because at first um I was, I was, I was like, man, she's going to kill. Like, at first, I thought the Dari, that the spy on Dari was Zatar, mm-hmm. and because they, they talk about she has the daughter of Darmal, Ansha has has this connection to the spy, right? So she she's connected. So maybe it's from her mentor. Yeah. Um, and so that's how she's able to really kind of find him more and know more about mm-hmm. him without knowing who he is. Yeah. Cause it, remember it said in the other chapter that they were going to aim her hate at the Braxani race. Yes. yes. So, and because he's Braxani, she like, I think once they kind of pointed him out to her, like she was like, he's dead and I'm going to be the one to kill him. Yeah. Cause then the way she killed him was pretty dope. That. Yes, 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 yes. Um, but before we get to that, um, let's see. <laughs> Spoiler, sorry. <laughs> this, we talked about Torja searching for Varric, um, but she the, she learns of Ansha and wants to talk to Ansha before mm-hmm. she finds Varric. So we, we've got two people that are connected to the Asian that are trying to find this spy. 
Uh, in section nine, we get a little more backstory about Varric and why he is on Dari. Yeah. And it was because he was he was excommunicated. Mm-hmm. And he was like, hey, if I do this for y'all, will y'all let me have a pass? Yeah. And they're like, yeah. Yeah, sure we will, bud. At, at which later on we find out he, he realizes, fuck, I am screwed. And, well, and then we, we find out that the Bruxani, it's a it's like their highest moral law that a Bruxani cannot kill another Bruxani. Right. And, and that's and, the whole and, reason why they sent him away to be a spy. Right. And that we, we found out about that that uh at um uh, in was it Oh uh, yeah, here we go. In chapter eight, we actually found out about the, that law with the Bruxani. Yeah. If you kill Bruxani, um, and so I actually wrote here that Varric was actually kind of screwed the same way that Farron was, because like Farron was led to believe mm-hmm. that he had this mission, and then he's right. like, he's like, oh wait, no, this is great. Mm-hmm. I'm actually gonna be here, guys. Yeah, see happy. y'all. This this works out great. They're like, it works. He, yeah, they're like, yes, but he doesn't know yet. Yeah. He doesn't know that he got screwed in that situation, really. Right. Um and so <clears throat> we talked about Torsion's ability to deduce who the spy was. Uh then I loved how so whenever Lonset No, it wasn't Lonset. It was Ansha. Mm-hmm. If she fights, you know, they set it up to say, "Hey, look, you fight me, mm-hmm. and if you win, you're free to go. You're free to go. And if you but lose, if, we both know what happens. Yeah, yeah. If you lose, you die. Right. Uh, but if you win, I guarantee that the Dari mm-hmm. and Asia society, Asia society, <laughs> the Asia people empire." will leave you alone mm-hmm. and you're free to live out whatever uh, i loved how as i was reading it it went from a physical battle because Varric was like ah oh, this is just a little girl i i can do it it went from a physical battle to a mental battle mm-hmm. and Varric ultimately lost because of his hubris yeah well she she went through the change, the change that the, all the blood letters go through. Once he once he scratched her that first time, she got the same abilities that the Dari get. She was able to match him physically. Like, because it, it even said that there's a few times where he would like he hit her as hard as he could and she blocked it. So she was able to match him physically. But I loved how he went from the he even says I, I now know what it feels like to be the hunted where it's like once he realized that she was using her psychic powers to battle him he got scared and had no clue what to do next like he started fighting scared i i interpreted that as she mano- emotionally manipulated her, him with her power see I didn't. I didn't think she was emotionally manipulating because he. He was like, "How did? She, how is she blocking everything? And how does she know where to step?" Because she was always. He would get ready to do something, and she would change at the last second and basically be the count, the perfect counter to whatever it was he was doing. Mm-hmm. And he realized she was psychic, and that's when he really got scared. Okay, yeah, I wrote that. That she, yeah. I thought I thought she was emotionally manipulating him, but she definitely be... does at the very end. One hundred percent does at the very end. Yeah, because it says that he moved in for like some big, you know, try to do some giant blow, and she grabs hold of him and basically says something like, "Feel my pain." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that <laughs> very Ghost Rider ish. <laughs> um. And then in thirteen section thirteen, so the the outcome of Ansha finding the spy, killing the spy, mm-hmm. it not only got rid of the spy, but mm-hmm. it actually cemented 
a better relationship between the Dari people and the Asia people. Yep. So that was really cool. And the Dari are definitely on board with supporting the Asia now. Be partly because Asia, even Lon Set, promoted her, like called her blood letter. Yeah, she is she is now a blood letter. Yeah. Now, whether or not she continues to do anything in the hierarchy, that doesn't matter. She is no. an honorary not She's just there. an honorary. She she uh she, she, she did participated. The ritual. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> and so we'll uh we got two more set three more chapters. We've got three more chapters and we gotta get through let's, let's try to not to <laughs> ru rush, but you know. Uh well, I'll, so I'll tell you my biggest takeaway on chapter six. Mm -hmm. Zatar, Zatar is still, he's playing the long game here. Mm -hmm. He is setting up something because he hires, once again, hires somebody that is of low class because she was a... She's a poet. She, well, she's a poet, but then, but then we also learned that she was a rebel. Mm -hmm. yes yes so she was demoted to like a class that could not make money for themselves basically had to beg for money so like anything she got for being a poet was like a donation like she couldn't charge a wage mm -hmm. and he hires her to be the poet well, she can't she can't she can't charge a wage either because she's a woman well there yeah there's and, that and but... that would be commanding men to pay her. right so but she's but like she, they get around that at the end because that. he he's like, all right, you are going, I'm going to hire you, yeah, and you're going to go out and you're going to speak, and they're like, well, I can't command, but, but if we say if we say mm -hmm. that whatever you say mm -hmm. is commanded from me, then it has to work, right? Because so she I think has... she's gotten some freedom for that too. So so Lance Va, the poet is so incredibly skilled at speaking that she can get people to do what she wants I like him realizing it I likened her poetry and her uh the her manipulation to the Asia telepathic manipulation yeah. very I I would I would say that was pretty on on point yeah I because picked up even, on that cuz even 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 Zatar was affected by it yeah because he he's said, like, oh shit. Like because he, he says later this. that he got to the point where he wasn't listening to her, he was watching the people's reaction. Right. Uh, I also wrote that Zatar has a um a sub dom fetish. Yeah, he probably does. <laughs> but so we see a word here in chapter six that came up in chapter five as an insult. This shem R. Yeah, it's a so, woman who gives a woman who rules command. men. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So it's so Varric uses it as an insult to uh, Forza, mm -hmm. and she basically ignores it and presses on. But according to the Braxani, if you are if a woman is labeled Shem R, she is to immediately be killed. Right, because he because that's where he was saying if. You are labeled Shem R. Even I cannot allow you to live. However, if you are, if we say you are acting at my command, then whatever happens, happens. Yeah, you, you could do whatever. Yeah, and that, to me, that was what that whole chapter was. I think we were we're seeing another move on the chessboard by Zatar, bringing on another woman at that. Mm -hmm. And she apparently, like throughout the chapter, we hear of where she is actually trying to work with uh, Nayar on her speaking and being able to like try to help her speak at a wanna, higher class level. I want to correct you there. It's Nayan. Is it Nayan? I could have sworn yeah. it was with an R. Her sister, her sister is Nayar. Nayar is the one who she wrote the letter to. One letter, one yeah. stupid letter. <laughs> Changed the whole thing. So anyway, so, so yeah, so Nayan, yeah, Zatar is Zatar is is accumulating women to yeah. to work. So, but he's picking women that are like the lowest of the low. He picked a traitor or a traitor's daughter, and now 
a rebel that was like knocked down a couple pegs. Yeah, uh, not only that, but a rebel poet. A rebel poet. Which they don't care about arts. At all. At all. <laughs> to me, that was the biggest takeaway from chapter six. Oh, absolutely. I, it, 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 it absolutely is. So if we'd see, like, I, I viewed it more, I viewed it along the lines of getting more insight into what Zatar is mm-hmm. moving on the chessboard, like you said. Yep. And then seven, we have get the chess chess moves of the uh, Asia. Mm-hmm. So we find out the biggest takeaway I, I had there was Torsha becomes the director of star control, mm-hmm. uh, which is the Asian Asian military. Yep. Uh, and she succeeds director Ibri and has apparently sponsored Ansha. Well, we, right she, at the end of the got right at the news. end, we get that he's the emperor says. So I assume you won't, I assume this is about the girl. Yes, and we know he's talking about Ansha. I really liked the so to me in stark contrast to the Braxani, whenever they started talking about the emperor and all the people that were there, it was a melting pot. Yeah, I loved was, the ceremony. Yeah, there was all these different people that were all different. They were all dressed incredibly different, and they were all welcomed. As opposed to if, if with with the Braxani, it was you're going to look this way or you're not here at all. Right, and, like, and even even like you're not going to live. Period. So two two things with that, I believe they were like, oh, okay, if, if you're if you're a director now, and mm-hmm. um then it's going to be majority women. Yeah. And they're like, well, there's two women, there's two men, and then the mm-hmm. Tassar. Yeah. Whatever. That was a hard one to say because there was like a weird I don't remember what it, <laughs> Yeah. Whatever. It, a Tassan. Yeah. A Tisan. And so I was like, what the fuck is a Tisan? Um, <laughs> and they have a weird, they, they well, don't, if, it, if, like if you read it like a cage, then it's people. little something. <laughs> Tisan. Tisan. T-boy. Hey, hey, Tisan. Hey, Tisan. <laughs> hey, Tisan. You want to go get some uh, food, me? Hey, so, you know, one, one thing that we both skipped over that I think is important, especially coming up, what we were just talking about with the different females in rule, was uh, Lan- Lanstva the poem that she created that Zatar challenged her to create, she talks about this myth. She brings up this mythology of the Braxani race. And they even said something about like, if all, if five women rule, then or three women are rules. I forget what the exact number was now, but there was like, if a certain number of women are ruling, then it's going to be the downfall of the Broxy. Right, and I so and I I read that and I was like, oh, well, that's interesting. That maybe that may explain why they view women so low. They don't want to fulfill this prophecy, basically. And then, you know, we get to the next chapter where it's like, oh well, you know, now there's three pe- You know, now there's two women ruling. So, are we leaning towards the way where this prophecy may be fulfilled? What's ha- I think we're seeing chess pieces yeah uh so with 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 the uh ceremony and that's this will be the last thing i talk about was chapter seven um i really love that each head of office presents a ring Mm -hmm. to the newly appointed head uh connecting their two offices so every, every every officer has five rings yep and those five connect them to the other mm-hmm. offices, which is very interesting. I did think I I thought the 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 ceremony and the visual there was awesome. Yeah. And chapter eight, we get a subterfuge chapter with new a new a new point of view. Yep. Uh, Turok, dinosaur hunter, <laughs> son of Sechava, uh, yep. is jealous and wants his inheritance Mm -hmm. and is plotting to kill his dad so 
unlike uh, Zatar, Turok is just a little pussy. Yeah, he's a drunk. And and so like Zatar went into his dad and said, "Hey, old man, yeah. I did this. <laughs> I did this, and you're going to give me my inheritance." Yes. Oh, and also, by the way, I'm putting my name up for your position. Yeah, I'm taking your job. <laughs> and then the other two guys were like, oh, yeah, hey, yep, there you go. And his dad's like, well, Bastard. fuck me. <laughs> 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 and meanwhile, Turok's like, hey, dad, I want my inheritance. He's like, well, what the no. fuck have you done? Yeah. He's all right, fine, then. I'm going to find that way to mm-hmm. kill you. <laughs> which that whole plot of him trying it, it, we got time skips there but it's yeah. like he takes he basically takes the next two years to try to become the perfect Braxani but the whole time he's like trying to figure out how to kill his dad and it's it's like it's like dad give me my inheritance no you are um you you don't know how to be an adult you're lazy well, I'll sh- drunk I'll show him <laughs> Yeah. Well, what am I gonna do? All right, I gotta set up this plan to kill him, but mm-hmm. I need to be a functioning member of society and right. I need to learn this and this and this. And at the end it's like, well, what the fuck did I do? Oh, I actually became what my dad wanted to be me to mm-hmm. become all along. Yeah. And and he knew it. Mm-hmm. And he said he's like, Look, um, you did everything, so you're gonna get your inheritance. And he's like, but I want to fucking kill you. He says, well, if you kill me, then you're dead. Yeah, because everybody will know you did it. <laughs> so, in the end, his dad won. <laughs> I mean, I, they I both thought, won. I thought it was interesting that you know, set the um, they went they they tried to do it on a separate planet. Like he takes them to this planet to Zark. Yeah, because he, he, he he had to have him killed. Yeah. But he needed it to look like an accident. Right. So this mining, uh, it's, I think it was a farming planet. Yeah, for, for whatever that, so, you know, you mentioned the the drugs that the Bruxani love. Yeah. It seems like a pretty good amount of them come from this planet. Yeah. So he sets it up. He finds this guy who works for this lord. Mm-hmm. And then he he knocks the guy out. I couldn't tell if he knocked him out or if it killed him. So I know they keep calling him stuns. No, it, it specifically said he was not injured, but he oh, okay. was unconscious. Right. Like if I you go back was, and read it, I thought it was he weird. Got hit it was like he head. propped him up and like stapled his eyelids open and Yeah. At first I thought he was dead too, but I went back and said he fell to the ground uninjured. I was like, okay, so he's not dead. Gotcha. But he's unconscious. And yeah. He props him up with his eyes open and his dad I, I don't even remember what the plan actual plan to kill his dad was i think he was going to stun him. i think he's going to hit him with a stun and then make him fall over because they oh, were like the platform yeah because the platform is in this planet stratosphere right so, so i mean he, it's not like it's gonna a make him knock drop. over right <laughs> he he was going to be hiding behind some crates yeah uh, and something was going <laughs> to knock over and his dad was going to fall yeah and but his dad is like i i know you're here He's like, oh, shit. I guess I'll come out and talk to you. And uh, his dad's like, all right. So you know how Braxton society is. Mm -hmm. I I already informed people where I was going and that you were going to be here. So if you kill me, Mm -hmm. then um, you're going to be tortured and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And everybody on this planet Mm -hmm. is going to die. Yeah. Because it's like if you murder somebody in the mm-hmm. Braxton society, they just smoke the whole planet. They don't care. <laughs> if 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 somebody is protecting you, yeah. So if another race or planet is protecting you from that murder and mm-hmm. hiding you away, and they find out, they just like Death Star. Bye. <laughs> we don't need your people yeah. anymore. Y'all are dead. Yeah. And you who actually murdered. Uh, you're going to be tortured for an extremely long time and your life is forfeit after that. So um, do you really want to kill me? Right. But the way he did, like he punked his son so bad because, he, because he takes out, because that ring self, like signifies their inheritance. Mm-hmm. He took the ring out of it and just 
chucked it at the at his kid's feet. Man, he's, he's like, "There's your inheritance. Pick it up." Yeah. <laughs> just, just gangster. Just got him. <laughs> so overall, and and that that that's the end of that reading. Yeah. Um, so overall, what was your um? Now that we talked about it, you know, I don't know. I we're we're at probably two hours. Yeah, we're we're coming up close. Definitely coming uh, up close. If we're not at it already, I I have a feeling this is our longest episode so far. Probably, but it's also the first time we're going over a book that neither one of us have read. Yeah, it's great. I love that feeling. Like, I want to read more books that we haven't read <laughs> to talk about like this, because it, it really does suck when you know all these things and somebody goes, "Hey, um." I'm not sure, but I think that this mm-hmm. is blah, 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 blah. And either they're way off right, or they're right on point. <laughs> you can't. You can't you, say anything. You can't say anything. You can't change your facial expressions or anything. And it just sucks. Um, but I mean, I love talking about stuff as somebody's reading it and be like, oh, yeah, hey. And so. But I am excited to continue this book although i have no clue where it's going like i think so i know zatar mm-hmm. is in the triune now and so mm-hmm. he's going he's 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 going to take over um the the braxton mm-hmm. uh empire does braxia have an empire or i don't they both have an empire i don't know if it's an empire because they keep talking about the empire as like it's a dirty word right so i think they just think it's anything under braxana rule and then the empire and then asia has its empire too right yeah so asia is with the emperor under the the five whatever you know star system rule and it's like them against broxana broxana right so i have a feeling he's taking over the broxy yeah i think Um, i think we're seeing i think we want to see like a almost like a show like they're not going to realize he's actually taking over until he's done it and then they're going to sit back and go son of a I think there's going to be conflict between Zatar and Turok. Yeah, I I don't I, see them really teaming up. I I I think the, but I think Asia is going to play a big part in them. So I think I don't I don't necessarily see them like teaming up initially, but I think uh, she I think Asia is going to play a big part in them figuring out that and this is pure speculation that they're going to realize that this whole war is dumb and they're going to figure it out together that's what i think i have a feeling that's where the book ends up too Mm and that these two between ansha somehow between ansha and zatar Mm -hmm. they end like this war is ended with like the 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 entire war between the two societies is is coming to an end. Yeah, that's 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 a, that's that's gonna be a, that's a big uh, that's a big jump, especially this early in the book. But what the hell, right? <laughs> yeah. So, all right. Um, so, what's next? What's the next? You've, I know you've already mapped it out. What's the next reading? Yeah, page two seventy two. Let's see. Yeah, page two seventy two is. So we're going to read to chapter through chapter 15. End at 16. Got it. Yeah. End at 16. So read to the end of chapter uh, to the end of page 271. And that'll be halfway through and we'll find out if we can figure out any more about where if, this book is going. If we're at least on the right track or not. Yeah, because it, it's it is a very weird book so far in the mm-hmm. sense the narrating sense and we'll get to talk about chapter 11 which apparently is her uh, one of her favorite chapters one of her favorite chapters um it's a weird book in the sense that 
it's so disjointed. Yeah. Um, Very much so. You, you quickly get a point of view, like, I don't, I don't think it's going to be the last point of view we get, but, you know, we got a point of view of Varric, and then mm-hmm. Varric dies. Yeah. So if I get a point of view of somebody, I'm like, oh, yeah, this person's sticking around. <laughs> nope. Nope. <laughs> Very Game of Thrones. Oh, this character's important, and he's dead. And he's dead. <laughs> Wait, but he was setting all this up to do this. Mm-hmm. Oh, it doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. He's dead. <laughs> yeah, he's dead. So. All right. Well, Mike, this was... I, I think this was a great episode. I I think we've um, we found some conversation with this book. Mm-hmm. It's just it's just funny because coming coming into this episode, I, I was like, man, I didn't take many notes. I could see this this book go this episode going quickly and be a and then 30, two hours later, minute, yeah, <laughs> I, I I legit thought it was going to be a 30, 40 minute episode. Well, if this if this sun gets any more in my eyes than it is, I mean, I, 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 you probably look like you're talking to a ghost or at least just a pair of eyes, one or the other. The, I've got to get a curtain or something up here. Is this is killing me? I'm looking. The person I'm looking at right now is not the same person I started this conversation with. No, you, you've I, like changed. As, as the sun has gone across, everything's changed. I've got to get a and curtain. It, and this episode's gone on long enough that you probably have like a hat tan. Probably do. <laughs> I feel like somebody's been out in the Gulf all day with like just and they come back and they you know they've got the sunglasses tan. So yeah, anyway. I don't know what happened. There's just something just they is at least it's the end of the episode. Facts. So all right. Well next well, until, we will next talk time. next week. Yes. Yep. Bye. Right, Have a good one. Later. <laughs>